SJC 12326, Lewis S. Spencer v. Civil Service Commission and others. Mr. Ruskell, good morning. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, David Ruskell for Lewis S. Spencer. Um, Your Honors, we asked the court to reverse the Superior Court for two main reasons. Uh, first, there was, in fact, a termination of Mr. Spencer's service within the meaning of Section 46D. And second, he was deprived of an opportunity to present evidence that his resignation was involuntary. Now, uh, the statute, Section 46D, allows a, a manager like Mr. Spencer, who has civil service tenure, to return to a civil service position upon termination of his service. That, ter that phrase, termination of his service, is unrestricted and broadly applies to however his service terminates. The legislature used the word termination to mean end or conclusion. I want to draw the court's attention to the Jones versus Wayland case, which is cited in the Commonwealth's brief. Um, it was only a few years before this statute was enacted, and this court wrote, any public employee may terminate his or her employment by tendering a resignation. This court used the word terminate to describe what an employee may do uh, by tendering a resignation. Um, the, the, the legislature is presumed to know this court's decisions. That was uh, three years before this statute was passed. If, if an employee, in this obviously isn't, isn't the case, but hypothetically, if an employee was facing um, an investigation for wrongful misconduct, and then the employee in Mr. Spencer's position tended the resignation before the conclusion of the investigation. Would, would the answer be the same, that he then is uh, allowed under 46D to step back into a civil service position? So there are two possibilities there. One is that the employer could decline to accept the resignation while the investigation played out, and then it would not be, the resignation would not be effective. The second possibility is if the resignation were accepted, then yes, the employee would have the right to return to the civil service position, but then his or her rights would be no broader than uh, the civil service statute, so could still be removed for just cause. And in, this, and in the same token, Mrs. Spencer could have said, uh, said to, to, to the governor, I'm not resigning, you're gonna to have to terminate me, right? You're gonna to have to discharge me. And then he would have had the protection of 46D. He, he could have, he could have done that. Um, he, was, uh, he was coerced and the secretary uh, strongly suggested um, and encouraged Mr. Spencer to resign. Um, and th that, that he had no reason to believe that it would have made a difference whether he resigned or whether he was discharged or removed. Um, that would be placing form over substance to have his, uh, his rights depend on whose name is on the letter that ends his service as commissioner. Um, this is not a situation where someone was facing an investigation or a process that might lead to uh, the end of his service. This was a situation where the, the secretary and the governor had the unrestricted right to remove him um, at any time, and um, they, the, he, he was told that that would occur. So this was not a, a remote contingent possibility. His, his time as commissioner was done. He was, re he was relieved of his duties, um, and th th therefore he, th there was a, a termination of his service for the additional reason that his resignation was suggested and initiated by the secretary and the governor. And in fact, the secretary herself generated Mr. Spencer's resignation letter with his signature already on it. So that was an additional action by the secretary um, and not just by Mr. Spencer. Do, Mr. Russell, um, so what if we have a, a, a senior manager and uh, the senior manager is approaching retirement. And um, under your definition of termination, could that senior manager unilaterally decide to revert back to a previous position, maybe a, a group four position, leaving a senior management position um, uh, vacant and not really allowing the, the, the managers to be able to uh, control uh, personnel in the agency. Why, in other words, couldn't a senior manager on his or her own just decide to go revert back and impact pension issues? That 
if the employer were willing to accept the resignation, then yes, the senior manager would be allowed to do that, and that was in fact the practice at the Department of Correction for well over a decade. Uh, some 30 or so managers, including up to the level of assistant deputy commissioner, did in fact do that and revert back to their, um, their uh, civil service positions, frequently voluntarily, though not exclusively, but usually it was done at the senior manager's request. That didn't appear to create any disruption at the agency. Um, but yes, that is a possibility, again, if the agency is willing to accept the manager's resignation. Can I ask you a question on the statute? Um, the statute has two clauses. One deals with termination that we're, we're talking about. But then there's another clause mm -hmm. that deals with termination for cause, which seems to me, if one w may read it as, as your opponent does, that termination implies an at will without cause um, situation where termination for cause requires civil service review for, for reinstatement. Does the statute make sense that we read the term, we read these two consistently? How do you get around the termination for cause clause in, 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 in the statute? Well, the, the reason why the second use of the word um, terminated is uh, it's entirely consistent um, to read it as end in, in both places. The reason why the second one necessarily implies that the employer is initiating it is that it's written in the passive voice and it has the phrase for cause that, as Justice Gaziano, as you said, um, wouldn't make sense. You can't resign for cause. Um, but because that's written in the passive voice, that has to apply only to an involuntary situation, but it's not because of the use of the word termination. Um, the, the, the word termination means end or conclusion in both places, and that's t entirely consistent. But if termination includes voluntary resignation, that, that, that's a big deal with, 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 with huge implications. Uh, why shouldn't the statute say that it includes voluntary resignation instead of whatever termination means? Well, termination can mean different things in different contexts, but in the context of this statute and in light of the legislative history where Governor King uh, sent the message that any employee um, who moved up into management could return, um, in that context, the broader reading uh, is the correct reading and makes sense. The legislature could have specified involuntary termination. Then the statute would have had a different meaning. But that's not what the legislature did. That's not what the government. What, that's not what the governor said. And the, when the was that a, a letter filed with with the legislation by the governor? Yes. The and gov did it? And did the uh, legislation pass basically as filed? or were there significant amendments? There were significant amendments, I believe, to other parts of the legislation, but this section of the legislation passed unchanged. Um, it, was, it, it was submitted by the governor, it was filed with, with the House, and it, that provision was passed unchanged. Um, Are, do, do we no. have any sense as to the context of that particular legislation? The only, the only legislative history I saw was what Governor King had said. Do we have any sense of whether or not there were problems with getting civil service people to take management positions? I believe that some of that was expressed in the report by Governor King. Um, I don't have information other than that in terms of, uh, as, the, as the bill made its way through the legislature, but my understanding is that, uh, yes, there was a, pro a difficulty getting um, competent employees to move up in management because they didn't want to um, forego any rights. Um, this was part of a reform of the broader civil service system um, that eliminated uh, civil service tenure for middle and upper management. Um, and while they were doing that, Governor King expressed that he wanted to give an incentive and protection for employees who were competent and qualified, as Mr. Spencer was, to move up into management. Now, uh, he, 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 he was last in a civil service position in what year? He was last in his permanent civil service position, I believe, in 1992. Um, he, so, he was in a different civil service position as he moved up. I think captain is the highest position at civil service. Right. And he had that position for a day, right? At that time, he did, um, um, because the way that he got tenure was by taking an exam and having that answer qualified. And by the time that the exam was given and he got that qualification, he had already been promoted one or two more times. So, so these leaves of absences you can take can go on for 
quarter of a century and you still preserve your rights? Section 46D is unrestricted in terms of the, the time of when someone is promoted and when they're allowed to revert to their civil service position. Uh, Mr. S Mr. Spencer also had uh, leave of absence letters from um, the state and from the D DOC um, in 2003 that were not restricted um, in duration, confirming okay. that he retained his civil service tenure. But I mean, it's, both of you seem to be have the same view of what the purpose of the legislation was, which is that you you want lower level managers to be able to go up or bump up a couple, but. We're dealing with something pretty different here, right? That the head of the organization is wants to bump back to basically a corrections officer two position, right? That's correct. And I, I think it's worth emphasizing the scope of the statute, including the first paragraph. The first paragraph um, specifies that it it includes managers uh, up to the M12 level. The M12 level is the commissioner. Um, it's the highest management position. Um, and the statute in the first paragraph explicitly includes middle and upper management up to the M12 position. The, the second paragraph says that it, it applies to every instance of a manager so promoted. Um, the statute is unambiguous that it applies up to that level, and it wouldn't make any sense to expect someone to be promoted from lower management um, directly to that commissioner well, level. But it, it makes sense, though, that we're allowing people to bump back to, you know, the grade or two below them. But we're going to bump someone from this correction officer to position, right? That's, Somebody's going to lose their job over this. Right? That's not necessarily the case. Because the statute gives the agency discretion to uh, reinstate an employee to their permanent position or to another position within the same agency. Um, this is something that the DOC did for uh, over a decade. Um, and if that were an issue and someone were bumped from their civil service position in order to make way for a manager, it would have come up through the Civil Service Commission by now. And there would have been an issue within the department. It I'm hasn't. confused. Uh, so someone isn't going to lose their job? I mean, because it seems like the purpose of this is some type of short-term pension kick up. Um, and, but someone's going to lose their job over this, right? That's not necessarily the case. Um, the, the statute gives the agency flexibility to restore an employee to the, the permanent position or to another position at the agency. Mm -hmm. So if there's a vacancy in some other position that wouldn't necessi necessitate firing somebody, um, then they can do that. The DOC was able to accommodate these requests, um, more than 30 requests uh, over many years, um, and didn't run into these issues. But meaning that no one, we know that no one was replaced in those 30 other cases, or for, for all we know, they could have been replaced in all, the, someone could have been bumped out of a position on all those cases, couldn't they? There's, there's nothing in the record about that, but if anyone were bumped, then that would be dealt with during, the, uh, according to the civil service laws and the way that bumping is handled there. Is there, is there any authority anywhere for um, the civil service using c the case law from constructive discharge or other employment situations to apply in this instance? The Civil Service Commission has uh, at least one or two times um, found a resignation to be involuntary, for instance, because an employee lacked mental capacity to understand uh, the nature of the resignation. Um, so I believe that that is, um, that, that is something that the Commission does, and, and certainly the Commission frequently says that fraud, coercion, or duress are, uh, are reasons why a resignation would not be effective. Um, and, and would allow the commission to, to review the... Are there, any, are there any regulations on that? I'm not aware of any regulations on that. Along those lines, if, if, if this was some sort of uh, involuntary um, discharge, because, and, and I could understand it, the, the governor, through the Secretary of Public Safety, is saying, we want your resignation, and your first letter's not good enough, go back and do it again. Um, so if this sort of feels like an involuntary discharge, didn't the commission already consider that issue, that there were something like 18 affidavits and, and, and exhibits, and to the extent that there's a viable argument there, why isn't the commission's determination uh, one that we should uh, uh, defer to? 
The commission did have that question before it, but the commission did not draw factual inferences uh, as it should have on a motion to dismiss. Um, there are material facts in dispute about the voluntariness of the resignation, um, and it comes down primarily to this phone call between Mr. Spencer and Secretary Cabral. The commission accepted the secretary's version of the call, which is that your resignation can have no strings attached and I'm not going to reinstate you. That's her version, but the commission should have discounted that and instead accepted Mr. Spencer's version of the call, which is simply your request to revert can't be in that same resignation letter. Um, and I'll consider it, which would be inconsistent with the position the Commonwealth is taking now that a resignation cannot be paired with reinstatement. So that's the second reason why the Commission's uh, decision is, um, should be reversed, because they failed to take factual inferences in favor of the non-moving party on a motion but, to dismiss. But, but now you've confused me, because I understand your argument to be that Pursuant to the statute, if he resigned, he's still entitled to have his old job back regardless of what he thought. That's correct. Our, so our position is that it shouldn't matter under the statute um, whether or not his resignation was voluntary. But to the extent that this court disagrees with that interpretation and believes that it does matter whether or not his resignation was voluntary, then there's an issue of fact. Uh, and the court should remand for, for further fact-finding on that. Can, can I ask one question on the resignation? Your brother argues that, at least in the 46 analysis, if you resign, you're out of luck, uh, meaning if you send in a letter of resignation, we're not going to do um, any kind of cause analysis. Uh, why shouldn't we transfer that same principle into this section? Why is it not equally applicable. So the civil service context is limited to a review of the appointing authority's action. So was there just cause for discharge removal, action taken by the appointing authority? In section 46D, it's not a question about that. There's no question that the secretary and the governor had the authority to remove Mr. Spencer, and he's never challenged that. Instead, uh, the question is, what happens after that? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not challenging the underlying removal. Um, it's, it's a question of, is he then allowed to revert to a civil service position? It's a different context. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boudou. Good morning, Chief Justice Ganson. May it please the court, Assistant Attorney General Jesse Boudou on behalf of the appellees. I'll start right in with the issue of Section 46D, and I think it's helpful at the outset to put 46D back into the context of the overall cause for that provision's enactment. Now, prior to 1981, managers of civil service agencies, just like their subordinate employees, were subject to the civil service laws, which meant that no manager could ever be summarily or involuntarily removed, but rather could only be removed for cause with notice and a hearing. And in 1981, the legislature changed that and said that while there should be incentives to promote employees to come up into management, at the same time, agencies needed to have the flexibility in order to involuntarily remove managers and control the agency at that level as public needs so require. And 46D was enacted against that backdrop. It was enacted in order to account for the fact that for the first time in Massachusetts, it would be the case that senior and mid-level managers at civil service agencies would serve at the pleasure of their superiors and could be involuntarily terminated. And that was the catalyst, and that is what the legislature had in mind when it used this word termination. But, but the, the, the trade-off was that then they could bump back if they were terminated, right? Um, and that's what this guy's arguing. And uh, Your Honor, the, the better reading of the statute here is that termination refers only to involuntary separations from management and not to a voluntary resignation like Commissioner Spencer. I think that's confirmed not only by the history, but by the text here. And I'll say first, my brother cites to case law and to statutes in the brief in which termination or termination of service could connote voluntary separations from management. There are, of course, other examples in the general laws in which termination or termination of service refers uh, to involuntary separations. As examples, uh, chapter 31, section 60, chapter 150E, section 8, chapter 32, section 15. And I think the point here is that what termination means is a context-dependent question. 
And here, that context is both the terminated for cause proviso that we've already been talking about and the civil service laws in general. That terminated for cause proviso, the fact that the concept of termination is used twice in the statute, indeed twice in the same operative sentence of the statute, tells us that both must refer to involuntary separations from Plaintiff action. takes the exact opposite uh, position. The, the, the plaintiff says, well, 46D says termination twice, so the meaning is termination, meaning could, could include uh, a, a voluntary resignation, but if you're terminated for cause, then the commission has to decide whether or not you're able to uh, go back to your previous position. So they say take the uh, termination used twice and come to the opposite conclusion. What's wrong with their interpretation? Well, as, as the Superior Court recognized here, ordinarily when similar words are used in the same statute, they are presumed to mean the same thing. And in the terminated for cause proviso, that language by its terms necessarily refers only to employer-initiated involuntary separations from management. And the earlier use of the same concept should mean the same thing. Although they're very terminated for cause has you know historic meaning in employment law. Termination of service seems like a different concept, doesn't it? I understand the word overlaps, uh, but it's it is an odd formulation for uh, you know involuntary termination. It's. It, it, and, and that is why context is so important here, because the phrase really has to be judged against the other language in the statute and the civil service laws in general. And we do think that the commission got it right here when it took this provision against the backdrop of Chapter 31 and the civil service laws. And fundamentally, this statute is about when and whether managers can step back into the civil service laws. It incorporates Chapter 31 by reference. It references the commission and only the commission as the entity responsible for enforcing the provision. And the commission's authority, of course, is not somehow strictly cabined within the general laws to Chapter 31. So, if this, were, so if this were a, you know, a one-level one shift, some ordinary manager, some mid-level -manage, mid manager who'd bumped up, and there's a change in administrations, and they say, everyone has to resign, um, or you're going to be fired. Uh, we'd be applying this. I mean, this seems odd to me because he's the head of the organization. He's been gone for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't seem to matter in your analysis. It, it, we apply the same rule to if he were a, a, a level 10 going to a level 9. I'm making up the numbers. Well, um, Your Honor, we do think a different rule applies to the commissioner by, by dint of his statute of appointment. And I'm assuming here, as the commission did, that Section 46D does apply. And I can address 27.1 later, but in your hypothetical of, of the, the mid-level manager facing an administration turnover, yeah. uh, clearly in that circumstance, uh, the manager could not resign and be terminated without cause, functionally a resignation and a termination without cause and an administration turnover. So, so the case would turn then on Justice Gaziano's first question then. If, if the manager is presented, you got a new administration, they're telling everyone to submit their letters, and the person does submit the letter, then they lose. But if they don't and get fired, then they can revert? I'm just trying to make sure it's all based on it's How based. You... It's based on two things. It's based on, yes, if there's a voluntary resignation, then that individual would be outside of the statute. If if there is a termination without cause, then they would be covered by the statute. And there is, of course, a third option here, which is what has happened in certain cases, which is that someone who's asked to resign, uh, in your hypothetical of an administration turnover, could certainly go to the agency and say, I, I would like to voluntarily bump back to some earlier position. And the agency, totally separate and apart from 46D, could decide to do that. And of course, in those circumstances, the agency can consider things like whether there is someone in that lower position who is going to lose their job or not. They can consider the timing. They can consider whether this person who is asking is the sort of person who should remain in the agency. Now, so, I mean, the whole theory in 1981 was to maintain a viable, effective workforce. Uh, under your vision of the statute, the legislature wanted to create a world in which somebody would have to say, 
I want to resign for whatever reason, either because it turns out to be the wrong job for me, or because I recognize that I'm a, I'm a victim of the Peter Principle, that I've risen to my level of incompetence, uh, <laughs> or for whatever reason. And that particular employee has to say, I've got to do something to cause you to fire me, but something that falls below termination for cause. Why would we put employees in the position, as Mr. Spencer was here, to say, no, you need to fire me. I don't, I'm not going to resign because uh, I want my job back, and the only way I can get my job back is if you fire me. So wh why is that sensible for the legislature to do in this context? I think it's sensible first in light of the total legislative history here. Certainly, one goal of the legislature was to encourage employees to move up and up and up into management. But the idea that, that someone who has moved up and up and up could then at the very end of their career move six levels down to a uniform position, I think would have been strange indeed to the legislature. And as the commission recognized, there is nothing in the legislative history to support that that kind of view of Section 4060 was intended. The other issue here is that this kind of interpretation would truly lead to disruptive, really significantly disruptive results for the management of public agencies. Because as Commissioner Spencer sees it, a manager can return to their civil service position upon request. That's a quote from the commissioner's brief. So really, in his view, it doesn't matter if there's a resignation. A manager could always just quit. And I think it is important oh, but you, but to your, But your brother says, you can, you, I asked, I, I resign. I don't accept your resignation. Uh, I think it's a distinction without a difference here because Why? Commissioner Spencer is taking the view that upon voluntary request, that in essence 46D, because it encompasses voluntary separations, allows a manager to demand to be demoted. And as the Superior Court recognized, for example, in the Brady case, that interpretation of this statute is really fraught. It's really fraught with potential for both disruption and potential uh, abuse if, in fact, a manager, including a very high-level manager like Commissioner Spencer, can demand to be demoted at any time for any reason. So you're saying, in, uh, with regard to the answer to Justice Gaziano's question earlier, that if a person, for whatever reason, says, this turned out to be a really stupid decision, I really hate this job, and I want to go back to where I was, uh, that would be frustrated if they could say, we refuse to accept your resignation. In that case, uh, if, if the manager would like to, upon uh, for some reason completely personal to him or her, go back, then it's going to have to be a matter for a voluntary uh, matter of negotiation between that person and the agency. But Section 46D is not going to compel the agency to do that. But isn't isn't I mean wasn't the whole theory of this to say you can advance as a manager and you're not necessarily cutting off any opportunities to get the benefits that you previously had that. You can go home again? Well, I think the point was to, was to encourage employees to move up and to provide that in the case that they were involuntarily terminated, that they would not lose the protections that they took the leap from when they first moved up. The point was also to ensure that they would be made no worse off. And under the commission's interpretation, they would be made no worse off because it is similarly true that for a subordinate civil service employee that a resignation means that you can leave on your own time, in your own way, on your own terms. But in so doing, the trade-off is that you give up the job and you give up the procedural and substantive protections that would otherwise attach. And that, that same trade-off should apply to 46D. So you're saying that if Mr. Spencer had said to Ms. Cabral, uh, I'm, I'm not going to quit. She's going to say, well, we're going to have to fire you. He should, have said, he should have said, if he had known all that you know, you'll just have to fire me. And if he had done that, we wouldn't be here. Well, if Commissioner Spencer had, that had yes, done that. That's a yes or a no. Well, if, it's, 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 a, it's a unique question because of who Commissioner Spencer was. It put aside the issue of whether or not yeah. he's risen to the level that he's If, commis if Commissioner Spencer, Chief Justice Gantz, if, if, he had, if he had been terminated, then there would in turn have been a question of whether that termination was with cause. And as the commission recognized in the decision that there were potential cause questions here. And so there would, there would be a second level of the analysis, which is, you know, was there was there cause? Okay, but you but but uh, you would have to then prove that his termination was for cause. Correct. So, in the future, the answer is never never quit. Always get fired if you want your job back. 
That's the, that would be the lesson that you would pass on to, you'd be advising civil service employees who had risen to the level of management. Your answer is never, never accept their request to have you resign. Have them fire you. And that, that, make, and that makes for a sensible, thoughtful, effective we, workforce in, we, our, in our state. Uh, we government. believe so, Your Honor, particularly <laughs> where, separate and apart from 46D, that manager could always reach an agreement with the agency to allow a drop down into a lower position. But a, a, an interpretation that allows demotion upon request is inconsistent with the text, inconsistent with the intent, and too fraught with potential for abuse. Now, okay. can, can I, I ask you to? Say we don't buy that, um, and but we're concerned that this is being applied in, in, a, in an odd way. Is there a lesser principle that says that, that someone doesn't get to jump back 30 years um, into a position basically to you know, jack up their retirement benefits? So I'd like to understand, is there a, a lesser principle here? Mm -hmm. That well, the, le the lesser principle that we've proposed is a lesser principle that applies to the commissioner of the Department of Correction, who is subject to his own statute of appointment, Chapter 27, Section 1. And in that statute, the legislature acted comprehensively to define the rights of the commissioner as they related to both appointment and removal. And what the legislature decided was that the commissioner would serve at the pleasure of the executive and could be removed at any time. But the that only answers Justice Kafka's question if the uh, if, if the uh, employee involved happens to be the commissioner of the Department of Correction. That's I think true. It's a, I think it's a broader question he's asking. Whether there's any middle ground here. Well, one thing that is unique about this case, of course, is that Commissioner Spencer's resignation was a resignation in lieu of a termination for potential cause issues. Right. Now, those, those issues were never reached because he resigned first. But of course, the statute has the exclusion for terminated for cause. Can you go and back to that statute for a minute and tell me how would that statute work or the section where it says termination for cause as opposed to just termination. If you took out the for cause in that section of the statute, what would be the implication of that? If you took out the, the words for cause, how would that section operate? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there would still be a sensible reading. The, a manager is, is entitled to be restored upon termination of service unless he is terminated, in which case his rights will be judged by the Civil Service Commission. I don't. I don't. Th I don't think if it you took out no for sense. cause, it would work okay. anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah. but but is as I was saying, it is unique here that Commissioner Spencer resigned in lieu of being terminated for potential cause here, and uh, it, it does circumvent the statute in in a way here, uh, where uh, Commissioner Spencer was presented with this option to. The the civil the employer, however, could have said. We're not accepting your resignation. We're terminating you for cause. If or terminated him before that even came up. Well, I think if the if the secretary and the governor had any idea that it would go this way, that they might have considered that. But they didn't have any idea that it would go this way. And uh, uh, of course, accepting a resignation in lieu of a termination for potential cause is a bit like accepting a settlement agreement as a plaintiff in a civil case. You can resign, as I said, on your own time in your own way. But the trade-off is that you lose the protections and you don't get to act as a prevailing party under the statute. I don't get your argument that because he's commissioner and because the governor can fire him for whatever reason, mm -hmm. that that changes anything. He's not seeking to get his job back as commissioner. He's only claiming that he's entitled to get his job back as a correction officer. I would say two things, Your Honor. One is that th that the very point of 27-1 was to ensure executive control over the commissioner, and that control would be Which compromised. Which it has. The go governor can fire him for whatever reason. Well, the governor can fire him as, under Commissioner Spencer's view, he says, I could be fired only as commissioner. I worked at the discretion of the executive, but only in my capacity as commissioner. Right. And what we say to that is that a removal under 27-1, in which the commissioner only loses his title and can change uniforms and step six levels down in the org chart is not an effective removal. And this is why the secretary, the very first time that Commissioner Spencer made this request, told him that his request was unprecedented for someone in his position, that it was likely to be disruptive to the agency, and that it would detract from the ability of a new commissioner to take the department in a new direction. And so you're saying we should interpret 20, Section 27 to say the governor can fire you as commissioner of correction for any reason, and despite 
Section 46D, uh, even if you otherwise could go back to be a correction officer, I now have the power to fire you without cause from that job, too. That that's how we're supposed to interpret 27? That, that, that is necessarily implied by Chapter 27, Section 1, and it's fully consistent with this court's precedent under the Veterans Tenure Act, which similarly holds that high-level officials cannot take advantage of general provisions in Chapter 30 that are not set forth in their statutes of appointment. It's fully consistent with this court's decision in Reagan, which held that a very similar attempt by a high-level official subject to his own statute of appointment who sought to take advantage of general provisions couldn't do that because but they weren't so, in his statute. So every subordinate employee that works the governor is subject to exile? <laughs> it's, a, it's a function, Your Honor, of of the statute of appointment. And this statute of appointment was designed to ensure executive control over the office of commissioner. It's a, I, right. I can't speak to other statutes. I can speak to chapter 27, section but, one. But doesn't that go really far? I mean, you've got these smaller agencies in state government too, where someone has to step up to, and they may be civil service people. I mean, I understand in an organization this large, but I mean, you ask somebody to temporarily be the head of the organization because everyone's leaving. And then they're, as, they well, lose Honor, their ability to bump back. If, um. In certain cases, Your Honor, where the legislature intended to provide reversionary rights for the very head of the agency, the legislature did that in specific statutes of appointment. As examples, the director of the state lottery, chapter 10, section 26, the commissioner of the Department of Transitional Assistance, uh, chapter 18, section 8, the legislature did not do that here. And that absence of reversionary rights in 27.1 should be dispositive. I mean, picking up on Justice Kafka's point, uh, governor's in his last six months of a term, uh, doesn't plan to run for re-election, commissioner of correction quits, uh, person who's going to be putting in his place knows that that person's not going to remain when the new governor takes, goes on board. Uh, under your theory, how is it going to find anybody who was previously in the civil service to take that job? Well, Your Honor, in, in, a, in a case where one who steps into a position of that level, the very highest levels of, of government, is, is to be treated differently. A, a, commissioner, a commissioner is different, and part and parcel of accepting that job is that you are going to be treated as different from all of your subordinate employees. Just like, just like a general in the armed forces is always going to be general and couldn't go back to being a private, a commissioner is different by dint of the statute and by virtue of his job. So who's going to want to do it? Well, Your Honor, it goes back to the facts of this case in a way. I mean, Commissioner Spencer asked to bump down against the context of, of perceived concerns with certain things that had happened. And someone who is in a different position where there are the absence of those sort of concerns may be in a different position, ultimately, in terms of some uh, request to the agency for a voluntary bump down. OK, thank you. Thank you.